Hello everyone and welcome to Drydock episode 3. Everyone seems to be throwing questions at me faster than I can answer them, so it looks like this is going to be a going concern for a good little while. So with that in mind, let's not waste any more time and get straight in to the first question. Friedrich Nielsen asks, I wonder why the British didn't keep the Barden. It seems like it was on a par with the Queen Elizabeth class, and those remained very capable warships throughout both world wars, albeit with a lot of refitting. Well, yes, the Queen Elizabeth class did stay perfectly viable warships into World War II, however, uh, the British did not keep the Barden for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of the obvious one being they shot it full of holes in weapons tests, which kind of obviates against uh, maintaining it as a viable warship. But the reason they actually did that instead of retaining it as a another combatant is because although it was similar to the Queen Elizabeth class, it was obviously different enough that it would have been very difficult to keep it around. Now, although both classes had eight 15-inch guns in two twin turrets uh, with pair super-firing, broad pair super-firing off, so they superficially look similar, obviously the Barden used a uh, mixed fuel system. It had German engines, German boilers, uh, the guns and the weapons, uh, the shell handling system was all German, uh, the shells themselves would not be compatible with the British shells. Uh, so basically, if you'd wanted to keep Baden in service without having some kind of permanent credit line open to the German uh, engineering firms that built it for spare parts, you would essentially have to have torn the ship down almost to the keel, ripped out all the engines and boilers and other instrumentation, put in British stuff, um, then obviously modernised the guns, replaced the guns with British 15-inch 42s, um, hope that the shell handling systems are vaguely compatible, um, at which point you're effectively bar the hull talking about building a brand new Queen Elizabeth class. Now, given that they did actually end up stripping down most of the QEs and effectively doing that anyway, um, I suppose there is a possibility that that kind of thing might have been viable to an extent in hindsight, but the thing you've got to remember is when Baden was used for weapons trials, they couldn't see into the future. They didn't know that the Washington Naval Treaties were coming up, and as good as the Queen Elizabeth class were, and they were kind of the leading ships of the Royal Navy going out of the First World War, they were also looking to the future and realising that people were building 16-inch and 18-inch gun ships. So I don't think they were looking really for the Queen Elizabeth class to hang around that long. Um, I think under their plans as of, sort of 1918 through 1920 you probably would have seen the class decommissioned when they reached the end of their first iterations natural life cycle somewhere at the end of the 1920s at which point keeping Barden around just to scrap it and having 10 years of uh, differential operation probably wasn't worth the calculated risk and expense. Peter Donnelly says so you have a channel devoted to warships yet you don't know that the HMS is dead wrong it's HMS captain uh, because you don't say the her or the his and yes Peter you are actually correct and I do apologize for that I am aware of it um, unfortunately it is a bit of a word whisker that you pick up when you're recording these kind of things uh, because outside of Royal Navy vessels and a couple of other um, Navy ships using the at the beginning of a, a ship's name is actually pretty much uh, par for the course. You have the Bismarck, the Yamato, etc, etc, because they don't um, tend to have designators at the front, or if they do, it's not one where the is necessarily wrong. So the SMS Lutzau, for example, um, or the USS Enterprise. Um, and to explain to anyone who's not quite following this, obviously HMS stands for His Majesty's Ship. So if you're talking about, say, HMS Hood, you would say His Majesty's Ship Hood, or HMS Hood, you wouldn't say the HMS Hood, because although that might sound okay to uh, sort of the, the layperson, you're actually saying the His Majesty's ship, the Hood, which is grammatically incorrect. So yes, thank you for pointing it out. Um, I was aware of it, but uh, as I, um, it just is a bit of a habit that I've picked up over time. I will do my best to correct myself on that in the future. And that brings me on to another semi-question, I guess, but I thought probably an issue I should address, which is the issue of the use of things like 
KMS and HIJMS, etc., for certain ships like the Kriegsmarine vessels and World War II Japanese vessels. So, most of you obviously will be aware that the vast majority of naval ships in service carry some kind of prefix. So, uh, as we were discussing in the previous question, you have HMS in uh, Britain, you have USS in America, etc., etc. However, helpfully, <laughs> certain navies at certain times, uh, such as well, the Russian Navy generally, um, in whatever iteration they were in, um, the German Navy of the time of the Kriegsmarine, World War II, and the Imperial Japanese Navy didn't actually believe in prefixes. They just had their ships as whatever their name was, the Bismarck, Yamato, um, Sovetsky Soyuz, if that had ever been completed, etc, etc. Um, which leaves us with a bit of a problem because most people are used to hearing some kind of uh, extension and so if you're talking about certain types of ship it can also be confusing as to what nation they belong to. Um, obviously Japanese ships hopefully you won't be confusing them too much with anybody else um, but when you're talking about things like say German ships if you say the Scharnhorst it's like well okay which Scharnhorst are you talking about? Are you talking about the World War One armoured cruiser? Or are you talking about the a World War II battle cruiser, uh, etc., etc. So that leads on to the question of do we use prefixes? And obviously, technically, uh, the ships didn't have prefixes in the first place. However, a large number of historians have settled on effectively made up prefixes to distinguish ships of various navies and help identifying both the ship in particular and the era that it was in. So for the German navy the most commonly used one is KMS. Although some uh, historians do use DKM which probably is the more grammatically correct because it it just stands for Deutsches Kriegsmarine um, whereas KMS stands for Kriegsmarine Schiff which in English you think oh yeah Kriegsmarine ship but in German, apparently, that doesn't make any grammatical sense whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, but, effectively, on, on this channel, to try and help with that differentiation and uh, make people aware of what we're talking about, I intend, for the moment, to continue with the use of the various prefixes uh, that have, are generally used by historians when they are used. So again, for example, with the uh, Japanese Navy, uh, a lot of the time you see HIJMS, which is his Imperial Japanese Majesty's ship, even though the Japanese Navy didn't carry um, prefixes again, um, just because it, it helps with a bit of consistency. So yeah, uh, comments in the description if you have a particularly uh, strong opinion one way or the other. The Red Devils 22 asks... Question, do you play World of Warships? Well, there's a bit of a funny answer to this because yes, yes I do, I play World of Warships. Um, I have played it since uh, the closed beta. Didn't quite get into closed alpha, but there you go. Um, so yeah, I've played it for quite a while. I have far too many ships in my shipyard. Um, and the hilarious part of this is that that question was asked and not three or four hours after that question was asked, I was quite happily blazing away at Tirpitz in my Minotaur. And what do I see in chat? But someone says, oh, Drakinovel, the YouTuber. And I'm sitting there going, yes, that's that's me, I think. That's a bit of a weird coincidence. Hello. Um, so, yeah, that was quite fun. Um, my first bit of tiny internet fame being recognised on another platform. Um, hopefully, luckily, that particular game wasn't too embarrassing. Um, but yes, so, yeah, if you happen to see me in World of Warships, feel free to wave, and uh, I promise not to priority target you. Make Me Think Again says, I was hoping for something on actual dry docks. Uh, dry docks in general, and floating dry docks in particular, are quite interesting, I think. And I would tend to agree, they, they are pretty interesting. Um... I guess it will have to join the list, the ever-growing list of uh, specials that I will do when I get the time to do the research, write the script, and record the video. Make Me Think Again also says, as a separate question, uh, I suppose this doesn't really fit into the format of this channel, but it is interesting to wonder what the consequences would have been if the Enterprise and Hornet had been available for the Coral Sea, i.e. if there had been no Doolittle Raid. 
Well, yes, it is an interesting question, and I think it would fit the format of the channel. Again, uh, comments below, let me know what you think. Um, but I'm giving some serious thought to the idea of including in the specials, not just a sort of extended looks at certain ships um, and technologies surrounding warships, but perhaps also looking at uh, the more famous and amusing naval naval battles and maybe some alternate history uh, scenarios like that one. So yeah, if you'd like to hear my opinions on that and reviews, commentaries on various uh, amusing and hilarious battles such as the Battle of Lissa or the Battle of Kibron Bay, um, then yeah, let me know in the comments. If you'd like to see that, I will incorporate that into the specials. Freddie Armott says, uh, did you just quote Dr. Eric Grove? Is his work important to your own work uh, research? I believe this is in a comment. This is a comment related to my uh, statement about the fact that the Washington Naval Treaty didn't prevent World War II, but may well have prevented the Great Anglo-American War of the 1920s. Um, so yes, his work is one of the uh, one of the works that I use for research when I'm preparing these videos and also in my general day-to-day uh, -day interest in naval history. For those of you who may not be aware, Dr. Eric Grove is a naval historian and defence analyst. Um, now, admittedly, a lot of his work has focused on the more recent past and looking to the future. Um, so, although that stuff has some interest to me, it's of less interest to me than the historical bits, but he has written um, a couple of books about... Uh, the, the the deeper past of naval history, a uh, history of the Royal Navy, etc. So yes, um, I do uh, take his work into account alongside uh, the various other authors that I read, as I've mentioned previously. Sam Stewart says, Hi, I recently read a short Bismarck story. Uh, this suggests that Prince Eugen may have sunk the hood. Uh, it's generally accepted that an 8-inch H, HE shell try saying that six times quickly, um, started the fire of the 4-inch AA magazines. Uh, they also note that at least one of the 15-inch shells hitting Prince of Wales did not explode. Uh, how possible is it that the torpedoes on the hood were set off by the 4-inch magazine fires or another 8-inch shell? Uh, if the torpedoes were exploding, would this have set off the main rear magazine? They also note that X turret never fired. Is this true? If yes, what are the thoughts on that? What do German sources say about the defective 15-inch shells? And what do German sources say about when or if the Pr Prince Eugen switched to using 8-inch AP shells in this battle? Well, that's a very long and involved question. Um, I suspect uh, at some point I will do a special on this, uh, the sinking of the Bismarck including the Battle of the Denmark Strait, so that will be an opportunity to e uh, to look at the situation in a lot more detail than I can here, otherwise basically the rest of this episode is just going to be wittering on about the ballistics of German uh, AP shells. However, um, to cover the, the broader uh, point of your question, um, I don't think it's likely that the Prince Eugen sunk the hood. Um, the 8-inch HE shell that it did land, um, yes, it did set off uh, four inch rounds however those were four inch rounds in the ready use uh, magazines and lockers which were on the upper side, uh, upper decks of the hood um, so that was external to the ship's primary citadel and obviously the main magazines and so I don't think that could in any way have been responsible for the sinking of the hood uh, in in part just because they were just going off on the deck, so their explosive power wasn't concentrated enough, anywhere near enough, to actually punch through and down into the magazines. And also, if you look at where that hit actually took place, it's far too far forward compared to where the actual main magazine explosion occurred. As for the torpedoes, um, there were experiments done um, by the British in the wake of the Hood's loss to see if that was a possibility. And basically, it it really wasn't. Um, setting off torpedoes when they're not armed is actually incredibly difficult, unless you're shooting at Japanese long lance torpedoes, and that's not actually the warheads going off. Uh, the long lances were notorious for going up in colossal explosions um, when they were hit by shell fire because of the liquid oxygen used in their fuel um, for the motors, uh, rather than the warhead them itself. So I doubt a fire um, elsewhere no matter how particularly intense, could have set off the torpedo warheads. Um, now, 
As I said, I will try and look at this in a lot more detail in a video on the Bismarck's final voyage, which will cover the Denmark Strait battle as well. But just to put out there my personal opinion, based on the construction of the hood, the ballistics of the guns, looking at the wreck as it's been surveyed, and also um, the work of various historians taken in aggregate, my opinion is that, personally, I think the hood was sunk by one of two factors, possibly either... Uh, something set off the 4-inch magazines, that's the main 4-inch magazines deep in the ship, which then uh, set off the 15-inch rear magazines in a domino effect. Um, so that could have been caused by a 15-inch shell relatively reasonably. Or possibly that it was a direct strike on the 15-inch magazines by a 15-inch shell from the Bismarck. Um, the mechanics of how that would work, it's very sort of golden BB. Um, but those things kind of happen. Um, so whether or not that particular kind of hit, or to be honest, the hit that maybe might have even set off the four-inch magazines, um, was a hit that came in high, uh, maybe passed over the main belt and in, or whether it could have been a sort of a semi-dud that uh, travelled underwater and went under the main belt um, as per the dud that hit the Prince of Wales. Um, I don't know, and I don't think realistically in the long term anyone is ever going to know. Um, because that section of the ship is in many, many, many tiny pieces. Thomas Burt asks, Do you know of any proactive justifications used for including submerged torpedo tubes on battleships as late as they were? Even ships designed after the capital ship engagements of the First World War still had them, which surprises me. Uh, was there an expectation that battleships would come to grips with the enemy at close enough range to use them? Or was it more that they didn't have any ideas how to reallocate the space, so they left them off on the off chance they might be used? Okay, so to put it in some kind of context, um, before the First World War, there was a general expectation that, yes, battleships would actually get into torpedo range, because up until the Dreadnought Revolution um, and immediately after it, the range of main guns was not so great that you couldn't say that ships wouldn't enter torpedo range, um, capital ships, that is. Um, because torpedo range was a significant fraction of uh, gun accurate gun range as opposed to total gun range. Now, of course, you had torpedo boats, torpedo boat destroyers, destroyers and cruisers getting in the way between the two. Um, but with that prospect, especially of, sort of the larger cruisers coming in, um, then it was still thought that maybe the torpedoes and torpedo boats and torpedo boat destroyers would cancel each other out. Maybe the cruisers would help with that. Um, the cruisers would probably be mauled by main guns, so there was a, a potential thought still that sort of the light forces would either kill each other or drive each other off as the battle lines closed for more accurate gunfire, um, at which point it would kind of be, be battleship, be battleship, and as the range went really in close, um, and again, torpedoes might be effective, um, or you might want to lob the odd torpedo at a passing cruiser that just to dissuade it from lobbing its own torpedoes at you. Now, you might think that the battles of World War I as, uh, as Thomas suggested, would have um, possibly disabused them of that notion, but not necessarily. Um, you see, at Jutland, although the main battle during the day uh, didn't have the ships close to that kind of effective range, you did have the encounters during the night where the ships actually did get very close to each other. Um, and a couple of the other skirmishes also led to some fairly close-range encounters between larger ships. So there was still thought to be the possibility that... Um, battleships might end up in relatively close proximity to each other and the durability of some ships uh, such as the SMS Lutzow um, also played into the back of some people's minds thinking that if you have a ship that's effectively crippled and mission killed uh, a torpedo or two might be an easy way for a battleship to send its opponent to the bottom rather than just pouring fire in a close range which actually isn't going to punch many holes in the bottom it's just going to rearrange the debris on the deck um, which depending on whose reports you believe may actually have happened in uh, the final battle of the Bismarck, with the Rodney potentially becoming the only battleship to successfully torpedo another battleship in an attempt to send the thing to the bottom. The new IKB4472 says, How effective were automated loading systems for warship main armament, cruiser and up? For a long time, the answer is not very. Um, the mechanics needed to automatically load a gun get very complex when you're talking about six eight inch and larger 
guns purely just because of the weight and the forces involved. Um, and that's not helped by the fact that most uh, uh, most ammunition, when you get to that size of gun, comes in multiple parts, which just uh, sort of exponentially complicates the mechanisms you need for an automated loading procedure. If you're talking about a sort of a five inch gun or less, it's generally one piece ammunition, so it's relatively simple to automate the loading procedure. But when you're talking about a shell and one, two, or possibly more bags of propellant all coming in from different sources, all having to be arranged in the right order, fed in in the right order, and then obviously the breech closed, aimed and readied, at the time uh, of World War and World War Two, it was generally just a bit too complex, especially when you might have sort of a twin or triple or quadruple turret, so you're having to multiply all that machinery up by a factor um, of uh, sort of three or four, plus all that machinery, something's going to be delicate, you're in a battle situation, there's a huge amount of recoil, sh uh, hits coming in from enemy shells, and it's very likely that something's going to break and then it's going to be very difficult for anyone to get in there and fix it. Whereas men can be trained, uh, which machinery at the time obviously couldn't be, uh, and not to put too fine a point on it, but if a bunch of your gun crew are killed, you can bring in other men. They may not be quite as effective, but you can. men are replaceable on a ship within limits. Um, broken machinery in the middle of a battle, not so much. However, um, towards the end of the war, you did of world war ii that is you did start to see automated loading systems coming in um for a number of ships uh, so the americans particularly with the des moines class uh, got automated eight inch gun firing working uh, the british in the post-war cruisers um, the tiger class got automated six inch guns working and uh, so th those were fairly effective i mean that increase in rate of fire was just insane um but unfortunately they arrived just too late to uh, make their mark on the gun era of naval warfare. Nathan Britton asks, or Britain possibly, um, Hey, I love your work. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is, why did the Pensacola have triple turrets super firing over twins? And secondly, why did the US Navy abandon the 10-gun design after that class? Um, basically, the hull of the Pensacola was designed and built just a bit too narrow. Um, it was wide enough to take a triple turret at the point that you had the uh, the second super firing gun uh, turret, but by the time you actually got forward, the bow was narrowing so fast that they found you couldn't actually fit a turret ring big enough to fit a triple turret um, that far forward on the ship, or indeed that far aft uh, at the other end. So they had to go with the slightly unusual uh, twin at the bottom to triple over the top arrangement just to fit the guns in. As for why they abandoned the 10-gun design after that class, um, well, if you look at the later American heavy cruisers, they found that if you just widen the, <laughs> the hull a little bit more, give it a little bit uh, more width there, you can get that uh, triple turret in, and then with three triple turrets, you can get nine guns, and you save an awful lot of weight by um, just not having the 10th gun, which would obviously require an entire new turret. Um, nine guns, firepower is only slightly reduced, um, and say three turrets, significant weight saving. So they went with uh, that from then on with a sort of a nine gun design in three triple turrets, uh, in part just due to the uh, the naval treaty restrictions. It wasn't there wasn't really any way to get a a twelve gun four triple turret design in on a ten thousand ton displacement heavy cruiser unless i guess if you wanted it to have zero armor and be able to be sunk by a particularly angry destroyer commander wolfman says uh, hey there can you tell me the difference between a queen elizabeth class battleship and a revenge class battleship yes i can um the detail obviously is a pro again as with most of these things a very uh, long and protracted uh video however in brief the Queen Elizabeth class were oil-fired, fast battleships, um, quite complex, quite expensive, and at the time Britain couldn't quite guarantee the security of its oil supplies enough to make significant portions of its fleet oil-fired, and uh, also the amount of engine power that was required to get the Queen Elizabeth class up to its notional 25 knot top speed uh, was quite extensive and therefore quite expensive and as it turned out in practice a they struggled to reach that speed and b uh the sort of this sort of mid-range speed where they were a 
three to four knots faster than a battle line, but three to four knots slower than the battle cruisers didn't actually help all that much if you could if the rest of the fleet couldn't keep up. So the revenge class, uh, to a great degree, reverted back to coal firing, which uh, Britain has loads of coal, so that was uh, easy fuel fuel supply secured. Even um, they kept the same armament. Obviously, they simplified the armor layout as well, because with some of the weight saved, um, they could make the armor just sort of solid 13-inch uh, plate rather than the variety of uh, thicknesses that Queen Elizabeth had. Um, so yeah, they they were effectively simpler and cheaper versions of the Queen Elizabeth class, a um, little bit slower obviously, um, carried a few minor improvements here and there the Queen Elizabeth class would pick up in its later refits, um, but you can see the, the sort of the economy of the design in the fact that the British were planning on building eight of them um, and got most of the way through that before World War One interrupted and the last few were cancelled. WC I think it's Weath, I mean it looks like weather but without the R at the end, so correct me if I'm wrong on that pronunciation. Anyway, he says, I would like to hear your opinion on, uh, and effectively this question boils down to, which of the two Yamato class were better um, between Yamato and Musashi? Which one was the better ship? Um, Musashi had less than half the AA defences at the time of her sinking compared to the Yamato, but she survived significantly more uh, bomb and torpedo strikes. Um, and if you'd consider also theorising whether her peers could have sustained that level of attack. Uh, lastly, thank you, and I enjoy your work well. Thank you very much. So, in terms of their ability to resist damage, um, yeah, on on paper, Musashi looks like it was the better ship. It took an awful lot more um, firepower to send it to the bottom. However, um, you have to remember that, yes, well, it had uh, lesser AA armament, um, at the point that the Musashi and the Yamato were sunk, it wasn't ever going to be really a question of if they were sunk, it was just a question of when, because the Americans had complete air superiority, uh, loads of carriers, and could basically just keep throwing planes and therefore bombs and torpedoes at them until eventually they went under. Now, the reason Musashi took so many hits, apart from the fact it takes an awful lot of firepower to sink a 70,000 plus ton battleship, um, was the fact that the Americans attacked it essentially from all directions. So there were lots of sort of holes all over the ship, but none of them were especially large. And with a ship that size, it kind of settled very gradually. Um, and to be fair, I mean, Japanese damage control, um, much derided as it is, they did a reasonable job with the Musashi just to keep it afloat as long as it did. So yeah, it was effectively death by a thousand cuts um, and took about as long. Now, whereas the, with the Yamato, having had the experience of, oh god, how many torpedoes do we have to send at this thing before it dies, with the Musashi, uh, the Americans sat back, revised their plans, and thought, right, if the next one comes along, which would be the Yamato, uh, we have to be a bit more clever about this. So when they attacked the Yamato, instead of just going hell for leather on all sides, they actually sent, made sure that all their uh, aircraft strikes uh, from torpedo bombers came in on the same side. Uh, so rather than having uh, holes actually helping to counter flood the ship and keep it stable, all the torpedoes they sent at Yamato all came in on one side, which um, exacerbated damage caused by previous torpedoes, so the holes and breaches in the ship would have been larger, uh, which made damage control and flooding control a lot harder as well. Um, but it also meant that all the flooding was on one side of the ship, which, would, which eventually then meant that the Yamato uh, rolled over and sank through capsize uh, bef long before it would have actually just sunk by settling to the ocean floor um, in the kind of way that the Bismarck probably would have if he had been left alone. As for whether her peers could sustain that level of attack, um, well, her peers being things, I guess, like, well, Bismarck theoretically, um, Iowa, Vanguard, maybe the Latorios. Well, yes and no. Uh, could they sustain that level of attack? Yes, I think um, certain other ships would have sustained that level of attack a lot better. Um, Bismarck, I'm not, I don't think so much. Maybe its torpedo protection system did hold out pretty well when it was struck uh, broadside, but its AA armament was even not as good as uh, Yamato and Musashi's. But to be fair, that's 
four years of technological advancement will do that for you. Um, Vanguard and Aya were both sort of late warships. They would have held up better per tonnage displacement, especially Iowa, because um, it was just cov you covered with AA guns. You, when I say in various videos, the American practice of there's an empty space on the ship. Well, why is there an empty space on the ship? Stick a gun there, you flipping idiot. It's humorous, but it's also true. Uh, the Americans did love their 40 and 20 millimeter um, and the five inch. So, yeah, Iowa and uh, Vanguard had very good AA defenses as well. So, yeah, they would have shot down a lot more incoming aircraft. Um, their torpedo systems had slightly fewer flaws than the Yamato's. On the flip side, they did displace less, so there is less ship to flood. So probably, maybe would have... I don't know. It's it's a difficult one to call. Um, the main thing, though, that it comes down to is none of them would have survived, ultimately. Um, they might have delayed the inevitable. They might have shot down more planes with their superior AI armament. Uh, they might have taken individually less damage from torpedo hits through superior torpedo defences. But ultimately, the kind of attacks that sank the Yamato and the Musashi, it didn't really matter what kind of ship you were sailing, unless maybe it was a HMS Habakkuk or something. Um, there were just so many torpedoes and so many bombs coming in that you were going to die sooner rather than later. Um, and there wasn't really much getting out of that. The Mythical Fire asks, uh, would the Imperial Japanese Navy win the Battle of Midway if they sent every car carrier, including light carriers, into the battle? So, um, one? No, I don't think so. Um, made it a draw, may or made it more bloody? Um, yes, potentially, quite possibly. Uh, now, the reason I say that is that having extra uh, aircraft... For, through having extra carrier decks there wouldn't have actually changed things all that much unless those carriers had been used specifically just to carry fighters to maintain a constant combat air patrol around the Japanese uh, carrier fleet because ultimately the reason the Japanese lost midway it was not because they failed to sink the American carriers but because the American carrier planes sunk them so that's that's sort of the elephant in the room. If the if you want the Japanese to win midway, you have to stop the American carriers from sinking them. And they didn't know where the American carriers were soon enough to sink the American carriers first. Um, so yeah, um, unless unless you, you sort of use knowledge from the future to tell those light carriers you have to carry all planes and just maintain sort of fifty zeros floating around the fleet carriers at all times they're not going to change the fact that the Americans are going to show up and they are going to bomb and they are going to sink uh, most of the Japanese fleet carriers. However, obviously, then there are still other flight decks around. They may uh, distract a few American strike formations, um, so the fleet carriers might not get attacked so heavily, and any surviving um, hulls obviously mean they can recover aircraft, rearm them and send them out again. And the Japanese did eventually find the American uh, ships. So with more planes and the ability to sustain operations for longer, um, then yes, potentially they could have sent counter strikes and damaged or sunk the American carriers in response, um, which as I say that wouldn't have meant a victory, but it might have might have forced a draw more likely probably just made the whole thing a lot messier and a lot bloodier. Spam Spammington asks, how effective do you think the Graf Zeppelin could have been if it was completed? So the German aircraft carrier Graf Zeppelin, to be honest, I can't see it being that effective, um, mainly because it suffered the problem of being a Kriegsmarine ship uh, in the mid to late war. So where's it going to go? basically. Um, <laughs> it it can't fight its way out of the Royal Navy's stranglehold on the North Sea. Um, and sending up against the Russian Air Force it's, it's not going to make a difference, really. Um, I mean, it, you also have the, the other issues of the fact that the Messerschmitt 109, albeit that they did manage to make a carrier-going version of it, but much like the Spitfire being converted to the Seafire, is not the most optimal design by a long shot for um, a seagoing fighter, um, mostly due to the narrowness of its landing gear and the fragility of that. I mean, 
the had ME109s regularly pancaking because their landing gear collapsed uh, when they were land-based fighters, let alone having to slam down on a carrier. Um, and the Ju87 Stuka, whilst a very effective weapon at the beginning of the war, by the time you could realistically have the Graf Zeppelin completed, Stukas were falling out of the sky in great numbers because everyone had learned how to deal with the fact that they were relatively slow moving um, and not particularly well defended. Now, that isn't to say that if the Graf Zeppelin had managed to get off uh, a full strike package, that it, a strike package made up of its naval Stukas and ME109s wouldn't have been. Uh, relatively lethal, because the, the Stukas were pretty decent dive bombers, and if the ME-109s could have kept the enemy fighters off them long enough, um, then yeah, it could have done some damage with an Alpha Strike, but overall, its capacity, its location, its design limitations in how many aircraft it could actually fly off in a given amount of time, and the fact that the aircraft themselves would have lost effectiveness very quickly, both from uh, aircraft being shot down and just their own mechanical losses um, from the unsuitability of the aircraft they were adapting, its effectiveness would have degraded very quickly. So yeah, overall, not very, not very effective, I'm afraid. Right, well, we're rapidly running out of time on this one, so and there's an awful lot more questions to answer, so I'm going to try and keep uh, questions and answers for this last bit a uh, bit short, so I'll, I'll answer some of the quicker ones, and uh, we'll pick up some of the longer ones in the next Drydock. So, God's Own Drunk says, I'd like to see a video on the South American battleships, uh, the Rivadavia class in particular. Uh, the answer to that is yes, you will. Um, they are on the schedule to be done. Jerome Chan asks, uh, what with the similar superstructure designs on ships, uh, such as uh, Prince Eugen and Bismarck, which led to the British misidentifying the ships and opening fire on the wrong one, uh, was, it due, was this due to design simplification or the tactical advantage of having similar appearances? Well, in general, for light and heavy cruisers and battleships, it was more a design and practical function rather than a tactical one. I mean, the tactical issue was useful, but generally it came down to the fact that the challenges facing uh, cruisers and battleships in terms of command and control functions, fire control, etc., were very similar. Um, and so once you'd arrived at one solution, it was just a case of, well, okay, just scale it up or down slightly. Uh, and use it on all the ships because they're all going to face the similar problems. And to be honest, um, size-wise, uh, cruisers were not that much smaller than battleships dimensionally. Anthony White asks, uh, do you think the CSS Virginia's prow would ever come into play in an engagement with HMS Warrior? Um, probably not, mainly because both ships are spectacularly unmaneuverable. Um, I mean, in theory, yes, it could obviously if it ended up in a ramming situation, but if that ramming situation did occur, you'd have to wonder what the heck had had gone horribly, horribly wrong for that to actually be the case. And finally for this episode, Malcolm Lewis asks, did battleships experience notable price increases with each generation similar to aircraft over the decades? So, yes and no. Battleships did experience a price increases uh, that were greater than just as a linear correlation with displacement would suggest. Uh, but they're nowhere near as bad as you get with combat aircraft, and that's because generally those above linear um, increases are, tend to be associated more with technology than with uh, raw materials, and that's new and innovative technology. Now, with a battleship, sort of guns are guns, armor is armor, a hull is a hull. Um, these things, the sort of their unit price doesn't change much except with inflation. Um, obviously, if a gun is bigger, you pay more for it, um, but those kind of things sort of that the price increases are relatively small where you end up paying the big money is where you have things that are radical technological breakthroughs so say the switch from coal to oil fired boilers uh, newer bigger range finders more advanced fire control systems um, and some of the other uh, technological advances inherent in larger battleship construction now you compare that with aircraft where sort of almost every generation involves pretty much almost entirely brand new technology all through and that explains why aircraft prices go up a lot quicker uh, proportional to their size than battleships do. So as we're approaching 40 minutes I'm going to call it there on this episode of the Dry Dock. Uh, apologies to those of you who've raised very good questions and I haven't gotten to them yet. Um, I will obviously lead out with your questions in the next episode of the Dry Dock. Um, but hey, having a backlog of questions to answer means at least we do have regularly scheduled releases if we have a few quiet weeks of questions. So thank you very much for listening, and see you again in the next video.